The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? The disciples answered, Yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, Jesus, what is it? Can't you just tell us what the kingdom of heaven actually is? Five times today we hear what the kingdom of heaven is like, which feels so far from a clear and concise answer to what the kingdom of heaven is. We've said it before, we'll say it over and over again, we want answers we want to know what God is doing, when God is or will do something, where the next thing will happen, and most importantly, why God does the things that God does. We don't like this mystery stuff. We don't want to know what possibly could be or what might be or what things are sort of like. But yet, that's what we get. That's what Jesus does, right? He's not always terribly clear, is he? Now, when it comes to how we treat God or other people, Jesus is pretty clear on those issues. He says things like the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. He says to go and do likewise like the Good Samaritan and care for those who are in need says to go care for the sick and show hospitality and welcome to the strangers and be beacons of light to one another in this world. I mean, those things are pretty clear. But then there's this other side of Jesus. I've heard it said that in the four Gospels, people ask Jesus 187 questions. And he, as you know, answers what? Like maybe eight of them? Because if he's asked a question, what does he like to do instead? Not answer him, but ask another question. Someone counted that Jesus actually asks about 307 questions to other people throughout the Gospels. Which makes me think that outside of how we're called to treat one another, the rest of this life of faith truly is about sitting in the mystery and the complexity and the questions that we face about how this life works. Which is why I think Jesus teaches those around him with so many parables. Because maybe Jesus' parables really actually do help us see ourselves in the story or, or gain some kind of clarity about what God is doing in our specific life and circumstance. Maybe we do gain a sense of security and certainty in our faith when we hear these parables 
Because these kinds of parables speak to us in ways that make us connect and understand what Jesus is pointing to. So maybe Jesus did know what he was doing. We saw at the end of today's gospel story how Jesus asked his, asked his disciples this question. He says, have you understood all of this? And what they say? Yes. And I'm thinking, really? Weren't these the same disciples who asked Jesus if they could sit on his right or left side when they get to heaven? Weren't these the same disciples who shooed away children and, and poor people and sick people because they didn't want them to bother Jesus? Weren't these the same disciples who still questioned why he had to go to the cross and die even when he told them that's what's going to happen? Gordon didn't even believe it when they heard that he did not stay dead. Have you understood all this? It makes me wonder if men have really changed that much over the past 2,000 years. I mean, I heard it happens that a wife might turn to her husband and say, have you listened to a word I've said? And the husband thinks, that's a strange way to start a conversation. Just before they, this before these parables, Jesus, they, the disciples, had to ask Jesus to explain some of the parables that he already told. And now they get five more parables, and suddenly it's clear to them? I don't know. So maybe we ask, what's there for us to get in these parables? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's like yeast. It's like treasure hidden in a field or a merchant searching for fine pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea. Well, those are a lot of things that the kingdom of heaven is like, as we've said. So maybe our first question is, what's Jesus talking about when he says the kingdom of heaven? Yes, let's start today with a question that's been debated and argued about for centuries. Is he talking about something that's here with us now? Or is he talking about something that will be with us here sometime down the road? Or is he talking about something that's to come in another realm or place like the heavens and the skies? Well, like I said, it's been hotly debated for a long time. But the way I've come to understand and believe it is that it's all of the above. Then according to Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is what Jesus' ministry is all about. In chapter 3 of Matthew's gospel, the first thing we hear about John the Baptist is how he appears in the wilderness pointing to Jesus and he's proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In the next chapter, as Jesus begins his ministry, Matthew says that Jesus says the very same thing. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's the way he starts his ministry. So if that's the basic thrust of his ministry, what is it that has come near? One way I've heard it described is that the kingdom of heaven is the name for our creation when it is rightly ordered by the goodness of God. When, it is, when this world when our world reflects and embodies the way that God created it to be. A kingdom does not come about through us. It's all God's work. But I think it embodies God's kingdom when we see it as God sees it. So what would that look like? What was Jesus getting at? So he said it's like a mustard seed. It starts small and grows into something unexpected but useful. Not necessarily a big majestic tree, but a big enough shrub to get the job done, to provide sustenance and protection in life. But when Jesus makes that reference, it also brings the listeners back to the prophets, especially Ezekiel and Daniel, who talk about a tree that provides shelter to birds as an image of God's reign and power in a particular place. But again, for Jesus, all it takes is a scrubby shrub. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, 
mixed with flour to transform it into bountiful bread. So this past week, I ventured down to Bible camp for a little bit of time. I had heard that at the start of the week, the the usual cook that's there for the whole week wouldn't be there until later in the day on Monday. So I heard the staff was stressing a little bit about how the food was going to get done. So I thought, I'll show up early. And and I walked in the kitchen and I said, hey, how can I help? They looked at me and they said, oh, hey, pastor. Oh, this is cute. (laughs) We got it. Okay. So I tried. I washed a couple dishes and opened a few cans and touched a few other things that they told me not to touch and just stood back and watched. But later on Monday when the usual cook arrived, the first thing she did was mix up a big batch of dough to make breadsticks for dinner that night. And I, no, I wasn't allowed to touch. I remember peeking under the towel that was covering this dough to see this nice round ball of dough, right? only to come back not very much longer, it seemed, to see all the dough just pouring over the sides of the bowl. And I heard the cook say, she said, you know, I never get my bread to rise like that at home. Only at Bible camp does it rise so big. It was most likely the heat of the camp and the lack of AC in the kitchen that caused the dough to rise like that But that phrase, Bible camp causes the yeast to grow so big. That's such a beautiful image of our understanding of God's kingdom that comes about through something like Bible camp. So the next thing we should know about this story, you may have seen we skipped a number of verses in the middle of this story. And so in that time, Jesus leaves the crowds who had heard these first two parables and he goes into a house with just the disciples. So it's just the disciples who hear the next three parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure found in a field. Treasure so incredible that the person who found it sells everything they own in order to acquire it. Jesus is asking, does our commitment to God's kingdom lead us to embrace this kind of wholehearted commitment to his work? The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who finds the pearl of a lifetime And like in the previous parable, sells all of his possessions in order to obtain that one thing. I mean, those disciples already did set aside all of their life's work and purpose, right, as fishermen, in order to follow Jesus. They've done that. But are they truly all in like this merchant was? Finally, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into a sea, that brings in both good and bad fish. Like the parable about wheat and weeds that precedes all of these, this net imagines or helps us to imagine God's work of justice that will bring about the kingdom of heaven in this place. This work that the disciples are embracing, well, they'll face a lot of bad things and a lot of challenges, sorting out the evil so that the goodness can thrive but yet God's reign will prevail. So, have you understood all of this? Can you see the kingdom of heaven in your midst? Have you experienced the hope in the midst of challenge, the passion and commitment in the midst of questions and the unknown? Things for us may not always be clear. There's always going to be some searching and listening and praying that we need to do for this to take place. But hearing Jesus speak all of these parables about such ordinary things, Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of heaven truly is right before our eyes. Thanks be to God. Amen.